All right, so this is just a quick introduction to sleep in general. We're gonna get into a lot of um, detail with a lot of this uh, material, but I just kinda wanna give you guys a run through of some of the basic terms. Um, how do we define sleep? How do we measure it, types of sleep? Um, the very last one, sleep disorders, have actually cut that out of this uh, particular lecture simply because um, I don't think that we really need to go into any detail because we spend a lot of time on sleep disorders. I was going to mention things about, for example, narcolepsy, um, insomnia, but we'll, we'll get to all of that later into, this, into the course. So there are no good definitions of sleep. I will be flat out honest with you. you every single book that you pull about sleep uh, will have a different definition. So this is my definition based off of a lot of other books, a lot of other material. Sleep is a reversible behavioral state. That's a very key component that it's a behavioral state of low attention to the environment, typically accompanied by a relaxed posture and minimal movement. One thing that we're going to talk a lot about in this class is what is sleep? How do we define it? And also, uh, what is sleep in animals, um, in other species? Because what we're going to find is that some species uh, have something that, they, they might have something that kind of looks like sleep, but it's not the same thing as human sleep. Can we call it sleep? Should we call it something else? How do we define it? And how do we sort of rank that out? So first, in, in humans, we can measure sleep by polysomnography, which is considered the gold standard. We have EEG, which measures brain waves, EOG, which measures eye movements, and EMG, which measures the muscle movements. All three of these are key components in telling us exactly where we are in terms of sleep. It, we have uh, stages of sleep and types of sleep, and we'll talk much more about those later. But just to kind of give you a quick sort of overview, this is the best technology technique to actually say exactly where we are in terms of sleep. Um, you need the brain waves to tell us what, what stage of sleep you're in. You need the eye movements to tell us what type of sleep you're in. And you need the muscle movements, which will also help with the brain waves to tell us uh, what stage of sleep we're in. Now, the problem with polysonography is there's a picture here on the lower right uh, of a, a baby with an EEG uh, not cap on. They actually have electrodes glued to this baby's head. Um, it's very uncomfortable, um, but with a, a polysonography, which we're going to get to much later, the cap, you actually put a lot less electrodes on your head, um, but you need somebody to come in to the lab. Uh, sleep in an unfamiliar environment, um, so it can be inconvenient for the participant, difficult to, to manage. Um, it's expensive. The polysomnography or PSG um, equipment is, is, is in the tens of thousands at the very least, very expensive, um, inexpensive to maintain. You need a technician to be there all night. And um, sometimes it's not generalizable. That means that, uh, you know, that night's sleep may not represent your typical sleep simply because you're sleeping in a foreign environment. Um, now we do try to run a bunch of different ones and do it over multiple nights to try to get at that, to get rid of that sort of bias, but it still exists and it is expensive and it's not very convenient. So a way to get around that is, is really something kind of like a Fitbit, but much, much better and much more expensive. Um, we call this actigraphy. You can do this around the waist, um, so you can have almost a belt that, that, uh, that measures uh, activity. And uh, the, the more simpler, uh, the simpler version is wrist actigraphy, which looks a lot like a Fitbit. It's a watch that you wear. If you look at the top of that watch, it's got sensors. This one can actually sense light. Um, so that's kind of really neat to see how much light you're getting throughout the day. And really what it does is it is what we call an accelerometer. It measures how much you're moving your wrist and how active you are. And then it has very complex algorithms to determine how many times are you active during a particular period of time, which we will refer to as an epoch, um, how much time you are moving. And if you're not moving a lot, if you're, if you're below the threshold, then it calls it sleep. Um, and if you're above the threshold, it calls it awake. Now, some great things. Uh, it measures sleep. Um, it's compared to polysomnography. It's decent. Uh, it's not perfect. It cannot tell you what stage of sleep you're in, and it's not as accurate as polysomnography, but it is not that expensive compared to polysomnography. However, it is still expensive. These little watches right here run over $1,000 per watch, 
and you need the software and equipment to uh, to also be able to house that. So measuring sleep can get very difficult. Of course, you can always ask people um, how much do you sleep, how well do you sleep, but people, and we call those subjective accounts, but people tend to not really know very well how well they sleep. Uh, we like to measure it in a uh, what we'll refer to as objective way. So uh, wrist actigraphy, um, polysomnography are all objective measures of sleep. So when we look at the kinds and types of sleep, what's really important is to look at the brain waves. And EEG can measure brain waves and tell us if the activity in the brain with each of these little electrodes are going to take a, a measuring point. If they're synchronous, Okay, so if there is a clustering of electrical events, if they're, if they're sort of uh, working together, okay, or if they're desynchronous, okay, so if they're sort of spread out randomly in time, then that tells us that there's a lot of activity going um, on throughout the brain. Um, if a person is wake, awake and alert, we'll see uh, mostly beta waves, um, we'll see some alpha activity, um, and we'll see desynchrony, which is essentially, there's a lot of different um, brain waves going around. There's a lot of electricity going on in the brain, and, and the brain is sort of uh, active throughout. Um, there, and I do want to clarify that it is a myth that we only use 10% of our brain. Um, that is absolutely not true. We always use all of our brain. If we don't use it, we lose it. So just to let you know that that is an absolute myth. We, even when we sleep, we use all of our brain. Now, there are different types of sleep, and each of these is actually represented by different brain waves, which are measured by EEG patterns. Your brain asleep is not the same as your brain when it's awake. And we see that when your brain is asleep, um, it actually is more active in some areas than it is when you're awake. Um, so your brain doesn't rest or shut off or anything like that when you sleep. Um, it it does, just does things differently. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about that when we get to the brain. Now, we have two major types of sleep. We have non-REM sleep, which you see as N-R-E-M, and we have REM sleep. So REM stands for rapid eye movement. And the reason why it's called rapid eye movement is because literally your eyes move, move back and forth like you're watching a tennis match, like you're following the ball back and forth. Um, if you have a dog, uh, or a cat and you've seen them asleep, you might have seen their eyes move back and forth with their eyes closed. If you have a friend, this is really creepy and kind of strange, but I do encourage you to do this because it, it's, it's, very, it's very good to see this. Ask them to close their eyes and you watch their, their, their eyelids and have them move their eyes from right to left over and over again. And just to kind of see what REM looks like. So REM, uh, which is, we refer to sort of uh, the, the dreaming phase, Okay. This particular type of sleep is um, a, a, its own thing. Okay. So rapid eye movement, REM sleep is its own type of sleep. Um, you may see REM, R-E-M, all lowercase. If you ever see that, that's not a typo. REM, lowercase, refers to rapid eye movements. So it's actually talking about the movements themselves. So how many movements are you having? REM, capitalized R-E-M, stands for the type of sleep. So it gets complicated, but just remember that the uh, if it's capital or if it's lowercase, actually does matter. Now, non-REM sleep is, is really broken into many more stages. We have four stages of non-REM sleep. Stages one and two are the uh, stage one is, oh, you're starting to fall asleep, but you may not realize you're falling asleep. Uh, stage two is a really light stage sleep. And then stage three and four, okay, so during all of these stages, we see uh, some, some interesting brain activity. But stages three and four is where we see synchronized neuron activity. So remember desynchrony we see when you're alert and when you're awake, and maybe slightly when you're drowsy. But synchronization happens at stages three and four. This is referred to as slow wave sleep because it's represented by delta um, or very slow, big, fat waves, brain waves. Three and four, stages three and four, actually very difficult to distinguish. If you're even a very trained technician looking at brain waves, um, may not be able to determine the difference between three and four. So, so we've started to lump this together and to say that you're in stage three slash four. 
Either way, you're in slow wave sleep and it's a much deeper, deeper sleep. And we're gonna talk in depth about these stages later on. To the right here, you see something called sleep architecture. And if you turn it on its side, it looks kind of like a cityscape. And we'll talk about that much later about, uh, not much later, but we'll talk about that later about uh, sleep cycles and types of sleep. But this is just to kind of give you an idea that we have two types of sleep, non-REM and REM. REM is its own thing and it's, you know, not broken into any stages, but non-REM is broken into four stages, one and two, and then three and four are slow wave sleep. So here's just kind of an idea of what I just talked about, that stages three and four, it's really hard to distinguish, and sometimes we call it stages three slash four. At stage one or drowsiness, this is a lot of times if somebody has fallen asleep and, and they don't even realize they're asleep, and you sort of kick them and say, hey, you were asleep, and they're like, no, I wasn't. That's really where you get stage one, or if you get the nodding that occurs in class, which hopefully you're not doing right now. So this is just a breakdown. We have REM versus slow wave sleep. Remember, this is stages three and four of non-REM sleep. Uh, we have synchrony for slow wave sleep, but desynchrony for REM. Um, REM sleep looks a whole lot like you're awake. It's really very interesting. The only difference is that you have complete lack of muscle tone. Your, your muscles do not move, you are completely paralyzed. And we're gonna get into sleep paralysis later on if you're curious about that. With slow wave sleep, you still have some moderate muscle tone. You'll see a, a few involuntary movements, you'll see um, twitching and things like that. Twitching can happen in REM, but it's gotta be a really powerful twitch. Um, in REM, obviously, you see uh, REMs or rapid, excuse me, movements. In slow wave sleep, you don't see many eye movements at all. In REM, you get very vivid dreams. You tend to remember them. They're very story-like. Whereas slow wave sleep, you tend to see uh, very picture-like dreams. They just don't really make a lot of sense, and they don't you don't recall them in like a story-like form. Now we're going to talk about the course of development um, in much more detail, but just to kind of give you an idea, we do see differences occur from birth to, to old age in terms of how much non-REM and REM sleep you're getting. Um, for many people, uh, older people, they have a harder time falling asleep, a harder time staying asleep. We're going to talk about some of the reasons why and some of the indications there, but I do want to note that a lot of the research has been done uh, that has been done on older people has been done on people who have a lot of medical issues and take a lot of different medications. So there's kind of an argument in the, in the field of, of really how much, uh, prob how many problems do we really actually have that's age-related versus disease-related. And we're going to talk much more about that um, uh, later on. Now, when we talk about cycles of sleep, so we talked about the types of sleep. Now, what's interesting is that we actually have, we cycle through these stages and types uh, of sleep throughout the night. And each cycle is about 90 minutes long. And within those 90 minutes, you go through your stages, one, two, three, four, and REM. Now, you typically don't go back to stage one unless you've woken. Um, you, you tend to spend more time um, in the other stages, and we'll talk much more in depth about these types of these sleep, these sleep cycles. Um, but if you look at, and this is again, this is a sleep architecture here. If you look at a typical pattern, you might go from wake um, to stage one, to two, to three, to four, to two, to REM, to two to three to four to three to two to REM. And as the night progresses, you spend more and more of that 90 minute cycle in REM sleep as you see the progression of the dark blue on top. But again, we're gonna go into much more detail. This is just a kind of a introduce you to the complexity of sleep. Another thing that we're gonna do is cover uh, different uh, species and how sleep differs. So we see, for example, um, the length of time that each species spends in sleep uh, differs. You can see cats spend, gosh, almost 18 hours of the day in sleep, whereas a donkey might spend three hours sleeping. Um, you know, we can see that it's related to how many predators they have. It's related to what time of day they're active. Um, so we see a lot of differences in different species in not only how much they sleep, but how they sleep. Another thing that's really interesting, for example, in dolphins, we don't see REM sleep. Now, it's important that dolphins don't experience REM because during REM, you have complete lack of muscle tone, which means that you go completely paralyzed. Dolphins need to breathe air. 
So if they go completely paralyzed, they're all actually drowned. So they have actually evolved to not uh, have REM sleep. And so uh, another thing that they do, which is similar to birds, is that they will actually sleep sort of one hemisphere of their brain at a time. So that way they're always have an active alert hemisphere. Because as I'm sure many of you know, and when you look at the brain um, slides, you'll see that, of course, our brains, we have two hemispheres. And even though it's almost like having two brains and they're connected in the middle by the corpus callosum, which is like a bridge um, to, of communication between the two uh, two hemispheres, uh, they can actually work independently of each other. And it's a very, very neat trick to have in terms of dolphins or birds when you're busy doing something like swimming or flying, um, you know, you need to be able to to have muscle control. And again, we're going to talk much more about the, the the species differences later on. But one thing that that I think is really important that we have to talk about is why do we sleep? Why is it important? And you know, there's a very famous uh, 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 sleep scientist, and we uh, I assigned his book um, for this course. This is the uh, uh, William Dement book. Um, he, he's written several different books, some that are more geared toward, um, you know, sort of the, the, the common, the public, um, that are more, um, novel-like, um, they they just are, are more conversational. And then the book that I assigned, the Stanford Sleep Book, is actually assigned to his classes that he taught. He would teach 800 students at a time at Stanford. Um, amazing, amazing man. Um, very, very cool, very, uh, much older guy. Um, he's been around and we're, we're going to talk about him, of course, in, in uh, his history of sleep. Now, he is the absolute, like, alive right now, one of the, the most knowledgeable people on sleep. And he's been asked many, many times, multiple times, why is it that we sleep? What, what, what purpose does it, does it function? What, what function it, does, it, does it have? And he always says the same thing. He goes, well, we sleep because we're tired. And that just means that we really don't know. We still don't really know why we sleep. Um, even the experts can't say definitively this is the absolute reason why sleep is important. We know that it's important because we are vulnerable when we do it. And if we're going to sacrifice vulnerability, then um, you know, that, that must mean that it has something to do with, with need. Uh, we must need to sleep if we're able to, to sacrifice time of, of being down, essentially. So um, we've come to learn that there are many reasons why we sleep, but we don't know what the definitive absolute reason is. One is energy conservation. We know that we need to conserve energy when we're not moving around, we're conserving energy. And so when we're still and sleeping, that helps. We can avoid predators, um, you know, if we are around during the day and our predators are at night, then of course we are, we are avoiding them. Um, we restore our body's resources. For example, we know that immune function is very important um, in, in combating disease and, and disorders and illness. And we know that when we get really good quality sleep, that that boosts our immune function. We know that uh, very, very recent research has shown us that Alzheimer's is related to uh, poor sleep. So um, we know that sleep kind of moves out all the, the crap that's in our brain that accumulates throughout the day. And if we're not getting enough sleep, then some of that crap accumulates. Um, and that could be related to diseases like Alzheimer's, where you don't have the the, um, the trash that's in our brain that's that's uh, moved out. Um, so we know that it restores body's resources and, and, and functions that are that are necessary. We also know it's important for memory consolidation, which we'll talk about uh, later when we talk about types of sleep, that uh, it's very important that we have this process of, of, of essentially digesting memories, of processing our memories. Uh, when you cram for a test, for example, and you stay up all night, you're actually you're, you're depriving your, your brain of being able to process that information. So you're going to actually do a whole lot better on a test if you just end your study, uh, go to sleep, um, have, a, have a good night's sleep, a nice quality night's sleep, wake up refreshed the next day and take your test. You're actually going to remember a whole lot more and improve a lot better. Uh, also, that can be also mimicked in naps. There's been multiple, multiple studies done to show that how bad pulling all-nighters is for memory consolidation. So that's just kind of a brief um, overview of uh, some of the terms, and we're going to get into a lot of these into, into detail, um, and I hope that you've enjoyed kind of seeing a, a 
uh, a preview. If you've taken my sleep class, some of this is going to look very familiar to you, but I promise you, you're going to see a lot of differences as the semester continues, um, especially when it comes to dreaming, because we, if you've taken my psychology of sleep class, we, we really didn't get a chance to cover dreaming. Um, and I think that you're going to uh, have a good time with that. So if you have any questions, of course, you can email me um, or and or you can uh, put the question on the question forum, which uh, you do get extra credit for asking and answering questions. Um, but make sure that they are well thought out um, and not something like, hey, why do we sleep? Because obviously we've, we've gone over that. So if you have any questions, let me know and I will see you virtually later.